Greetings in the wonderful name of Jesus. It is time for us to fellowship in the word of God. Thank you for gathering with me around the table of truth. We're excited for God is ministering to our hearts compassion concerning the great compassion. Yes, God's love being demonstrated in the world through the church. You and I are representing Christ, being his ambassadors, being having the ministry of reconciliation, showing people not only to know about God, but how to know him and be known of him by a personal relationship through faith in Jesus Christ. But we're going to pray and go right into our lesson. Father, we thank you for this time to be able to minister concerning your heart, Father. Your heart is for sinners. You died for sinners. You love us. You redeemed us. You sanctified us. You gave us the Holy Spirit, and we're thankful today, Father. And Father, there's so many others that we know that you have called into your kingdom, into your family, and just as someone shared with us the good news of Jesus, help us to have the truth in us that we might be able to go and share that truth with others. For it is not your will that people die without knowing Christ, Father. It is your will for them to know Christ, to have the love of God in their hearts, to be a child of the Most High. And we pray for that harvest of souls, Father. We pray you would keep us uh, desiring to see people come into the kingdom of God, the family of God, getting born again having knowledge of God's word and knowing the will of God for their lives through the knowledge of your word. Thank you now, God, for giving us a hunger and a desire to see souls brought into your family in the wonderful name of Jesus. Bless our time together, Father. Let it be fruitful. Let it be edifying. Let it be equipping. Let it be enriching. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're talking about the great compassion. And the scripture is Psalms 116 verse 5 say the Lord is gracious and righteous and full of compassion. We said this is the revelation of who God is in the midst of human experiences both good and bad. What it does, it brings humanity to a place of decision making in regard to the message and ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. In our last lesson, we were able to focus our attention on the parable that Jesus gave uh, relative to the lost sheep. God's will is for people to come into his covenant family. And this is one of the reasons why he left the church here, so that we could be his ambassadors, his representatives. Well, Jesus is considered the forerunner. And when we use that term, we are saying that Jesus Christ has gone before us to prepare the way. His ministry and message is clear. God sent Jesus into the world to die for sinners. 1 Timothy 1 verse 15 uh, says this, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. God loved sinners. Jesus died for sinners. For sinners to be saved, they must hear the truth and receive that truth. In John 18, 37, the Bible says this, Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus made it crystal clear in scripture that he is the only uh, way that a person can become in relationship with God the Father. They must come through the Son, Jesus Christ. And in John 18, 37, the Bible say for this purpose Jesus said I was born and for this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth what do they need they need truth in order for people to live a transformed life in Christ they have to first have truth and those of us who have heard and received the truth concerning Jesus Christ in his saving grace now must allow the great compassion of God to lead us into what we call the great commission of God we have seen this witness uh, in the life and death of Lazarus. That was a great testimony there in John chapter 11. And as I made reference to the parable of the lost sheep. And today I want to move further from a parable to a person who get to experience the great compassion of God through the Lord Jesus Christ. So take your Bibles and turn with me to Luke's gospel uh, chapter 19. This particular individual is a great witness of a person whose heart is longing for something. They don't know what it is they're longing for, like you and I were perhaps. We knew that there was something missing because we were spiritually blind. We weren't able to identify what that specifically was, but I believe in every human heart 
there is a place that only God can fulfill in that person's life. So in Luke chapter 19, we get to witness Jesus in an act of compassion toward a sinner by the name of Lazarus. And the Bible says in verse number one, then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector and he was rich. And he sought to see who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd, for he was a short stature. I believe Zacchaeus can be a great example to us because sometimes we don't realize what God has already been doing and working in the heart of a person and they're right at that point where the seed perhaps have been planted, it has been watered and God is ready for that seed to bring a harvest but he needs someone who understands the great compassion of God to be an instrument in being able to allow him to take the seed of the word or truth that was planted, the seed of the word or truth that was watered or cultivated, now God is ready to bring a harvest, spiritual fruit in the life of a sinner, and in this particular case, by the name of Zacchaeus. What are some lessons we can learn? First thing I think we can learn from Zacchaeus, and one thing we can learn from Zacchaeus is that Zacchaeus, he is open to the gospel. There are times during the great compassion, you will find those who are not open to the gospel and those who are open to the gospel. Those who are not open are those who are spiritually blinded and have no intention or desire to change. They do not know they are spiritually blind because scripture reveals this and they don't know the scripture. They don't understand the scripture. They don't understand spiritual things. 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4, listen to what the Bible says. And even if our gospel is veiled or covered up or hidden, it is veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So they have a spiritual condition. And that's why we have to use spiritual weapons, spiritual weapons of prayer, truth, the word of God. Those are the things that cause that spiritual blindness to come off them. But I want us to see, they don't know that. They don't know they're spiritually blind. In Matthew 7, in verse 6, Jesus said, Do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you in pieces. God knows the heart that's ready. God knows where the harvest is. God knows where the fields are white and ready to be reaped. But we have to be the instruments that God used in order to go into the harvest field that souls may come into his kingdom. So there are times that in the great compassion, there are people who are not open, but there are people who are open. Ephesians 4, 17 and 18 says this. Here is what I'm telling you. I am speaking for the Lord as I warn you. You must no longer live as the Gentiles do. Their thoughts don't have any purpose. They can't understand the truth. They are separated from the life of God. That's because they don't know him. And they don't know him because their hearts are stubborn. Paul is making reference to these Gentiles who were rejecting the gospel. Would not receive the message. God sends the message to the Jews. And they don't understand that God is only wanting to use them so the message can come to them and go through them to the nations of the world. Therefore, God raises up what? The Apostle Paul, whose assignment is specifically directed toward the Gentiles, those who don't have 
a Jewish background, those who don't have Old Testament knowledge, but they get to drink of the new wine, the revelation concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. And 1 Thessalonians 2.13, listen to this group of people. For this reason, we also constantly thank God that when you receive the word of God, which you've heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but for what it really is, the word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. Notice, they heard the word, they received the word, therefore the word was able to perform the work that God has designed for the, work to, the word to do in their lives. But they have to first what? They have to hear the word. They have to receive the word of God. So we have people who we uh, see in scripture who are not open to the gospel. They're stubborn. They're rebellious. Those who fought against Jesus. Those traditionalists. Those blind Pharisees. Jesus even on one occasion said they were blind. They were blind leading the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, they both fall in the ditch. Their hearts weren't open to the gospel. When Jesus tried to give them revelation concerning the kingdom of God, concerning the righteousness of God, concerning who he was, being God's represent, God incarnate, they sought to stone him. They sought to kill him. They sought to run him out of their midst. What was it? They were not open to the gospel. But there are those who are open, those who are ready. Those who God know, I want to be able to use my church in the earth to reach out to this group of people because their hearts are ready. Jesus said, the fields are white. They're ready. So here's the question. How do we know he's open? How do we know Zacchaeus is open? I believe that we can look at his actions because the Bible say in verse 4, so he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him. What he's doing? Something is missing in this man's life. Something is missing in this rich tax collector's life. Something is re re missing in this chief tax collector. He's not fulfilled. Evidently, he's heard something about Jesus. Heard something about his ministry, his miracles. So when he hear that Jesus is coming, even though he has some things he's got to work and overcome, his stature, he's short. He wants to see Jesus. And so the Bible say, for he was going to pass that way. He was intentional. I believe this reveals his actions reveal he's open to the gospel. He's open to the message of Jesus. He's open to hear more about Jesus. That's very important because I believe that sometimes we can look for signs that he's open. Jesus knew he was open. Hallelujah. I think some of the signs we know when a person is open is when we are desiring the harvest. Love. Love will help you and I be intentional, being prayerful, being motivated, that we don't want to just live our lives without taking on the ministry of reconciliation. You got to have a love for souls. You got to have a love for to see people come out of darkness. You got to have, a, and God has to put that in your heart. And I believe if you're born again, you have the spirit of God. You got a love for souls. You want to see people come in the kingdom. You may need some training. You may need some encouragement. You may need some equipment so you can have the confidence to share your faith. You may need somebody to walk you through a discipleship, evangelism type training thing. But in your heart of heart, if you are born again, if you tasted the goodness of God, if you witness the goodness of God, the love of God, you want to share that with others. So I believe when we see signs that a person is open, it's because we have a love for God and we want to see souls come into the kingdom. I think boldness is another a sign. If you're going to be able to reach people for Christ, you got to have boldness. You can't be timid. You can't be fearful. You can't be afraid of them calling you uh, names. You're not to be the shame of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to all those who believe, to the Jew and to the Gentiles. He said, if you be ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you before my Father in heaven. So I want to encourage you, make sure and pray for God to give you boldness. That's what the early church did in the book of Acts when they tried to shut them down to no longer preach in the name of Jesus. What they were saying, stop preaching the truth. 
Stop preaching things that's holding people accountable. Stop preaching things that cause people to see they need to change their way of life. And they said, oh, but we can't help but preach those things which Jesus has made known to us. And I'm paraphrasing. But then the Bible says, in Acts chapter 4, they prayed for boldness. Lord, grant unto our boldness that we may speak your word. And that you will confirm it with signs and wonders. And the Bible said they will fill with the Holy Ghost. I believe when you're filled with the Holy Ghost, you got the boldness of God. Hallelujah. I think sincere questions. I think that's another sign. When you find someone who is genuine and sincere, they're asking certain questions. It's not like they're questioning God. They just won't understand it. I think that's another sign. I think a sign prayerfulness. If you're praying for someone, if you're praying for the soul, the salvation of someone, be open. Those prayers are prevailing. You want to be sensitive to the Lord. And that's another one. Sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. That's another reason I believe. I think people who have been rejected by society. Ostracized. Marginalized. The world has rejected them. I think those people can be very open to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I think faith is another thing. When you sense the Lord leading you to share the love of God, the grace of God, the compassion of God. I think that's faith. When you act on it, you see the fruit of it. Somebody, boy, you, all of a sudden you start sharing your story with them about Christ. You don't realize that's exactly what they need to hear. That's exactly what got their attention. And so there are other things, but there are signs that you can look at a person's actions or reactions. Uh, Zacchaeus is showing me some signs that this man is searching for something in his life. And there are a lot of people. They are longing. They are searching. They are hurting. Hallelujah. They need help, but they just don't know. They're spiritually blind. They're confused by religion. They're confused because so many things they've heard. They're confused because they saw somebody who had a title and they did all kinds of evil stuff. They're confused. They're confused. But thank God, when truth comes, it drives out confusion. When truth comes, it drives out fear. When truth comes, people have to make a decision for themselves. And so he's open to the gospel. Another thing I notice about this, he experienced non-judgmental acceptance. Look at verse 5. The Bible says, and when Jesus came to the place, what place? The place where Zacchaeus was. The place where he knew this man's heart was ready. That Jesus came to the place. He looked up and saw him and said to him, now listen, he said to him, Zacchaeus. Boy, that's personal. That's personal. It's a personal invitation. It means you are significant. It means I know your name. It means I'm about relationship building. And sometimes people, they want to share God's gospel, but they don't want to build relationships. They want to share the gospel of Jesus, but they don't want to become uh, a, a part of the culture of the people. Or they think they're better than the people. But you got to show the love of God in a personal relationship, a personal encounter. He's having a personal moment with Jesus. So Jesus said, Zacchaeus, uh, uh, make haste and come down. For today, I must stay at your house. Now, I want you to grab this now. Jesus know how this man is living. Jesus know this man's reputation as a tax collector. His own Jewish brothers don't trust him, don't like him, because they think that he has, as folks say, jumped ship. He's working for the Roman government. He's oppressing his own brothers. They don't like him. He's a tax collector. They're not welcoming him into their circle. He's been marginalized. He's insignificant. We don't get along with him. But yet Jesus said, I want to come to your house. Hallelujah. You mean, Jesus, you're willing to come to my house, a sinner? What he's doing? Acceptance. He's experiencing acceptance. And so often, when we go out with the great compassion of God, it's the compassion that keeps us from being judgmental. When you don't have compassion, you are looking at their lifestyle rather than their life. Jesus knows this man's lifestyle. That's not his focus. His life, his heart, his spiritual condition is the focus. Matthew 7, 1 and 2 says this, Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And what measure you meet, it shall be measured again. I believe if we grab the revelation of that, 
We will be willing to extend mercy. We will be willing to not look at a person's lifestyle. There are people who won't even have conversation with people or do certain things for people because I know how they're living. Sometimes people get mad at the pastor because the pastor may go and provide a service for someone whom they know is living a certain lifestyle. You got to believe something. This pastor may have prayed and heard from God and they're not sitting there compromising, but they see the bigger picture that even going through the process, I'm able to cultivate or see the truth in this person's life. Oh man, I tell you, some church got you so caught, so many rules and regulations. It's almost like you got to be perfect in order to be a part of anything that they are doing. That's not the kingdom of God. Jesus knows Zacchaeus' life. He knows his lifestyle, but yet he's willing to come in relationship and let Zacchaeus know that, get this, your Jewish brothers, they reject you because you are of an occupation that they don't respect. I know your occupation and I know there are sins beyond just uh, uh, your occupation in your life, but I'm not here to condemn you. I am here to convince you that I am the light of the world. I am the truth. I am the way. So what happened? He experienced Non-judgmental acceptance. That's important. I want you to grab this, Christians. We got to stop operating in judging sinners. Sin. Now, if there's a brother, brother, sister in Christ. There's a way the Bible tells us how we need to approach them in love and restoration. But sinners, that's how they live. Why attack their lifestyle? Why attack what they're doing that you once did? Why hold them into contempt? Why hold them in judgment to things you did in your life when you were a sinner? My point is this. God wants to use you and I in the ministry of reconciliation. And if we're going to be used by God, we got to have the great compassion. Get this as the foundation for the great commission. We got to make sure that love is our motivation and that God will deal with their lifestyle. We want to present them the light of truth so they can experience a transformed life through the message of Christ. Hallelujah. Once individuals allow God's love to enter their hearts, the ministry of the Holy Spirit and the message of truth will bring conviction of sin. That's what the Holy Spirit does. And so we see then Jesus lets him know I'm coming to your house today. Notice, notice this third thing here is that he valued the opinion of God above the opinion of man. That's very important because the text says in verse 6, so he made haste and came down and received him joy. Zacchaeus is excited that Jesus, the Christ, knows his name. Get this, is willing to come in his setting. Jesus, the Lord of glory, the most holy God, the mighty king, is willing to connect with a sinner, a tax collector. So he's joyful, he's excited. But when they saw it, they all complained, saying he is gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. Had Zacchaeus valued the opinion of man, he would not have experienced the grace of God. If he allowed what they were saying about him, if he allowed their judgment and their condemnation, he would not have experienced the grace of God. But he's willing to take his eyes off man and put his eyes on the word. He's willing to not allow the distraction of those who knew him in his lifestyle to hold him back from the word. He's willing to go with the word. And I want to encourage you today. You go with the word of God. You go with the truth of the message of Christ. You let that get your attention. You let that be the focus of your heart. Not the opinion of man. So he valued the opinion of God above the opinion of man. How do you know? Look at verse 8. Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord. Look Lord. I give half 
for my goods to the poor, and if I have taken anything from anyone my, by false accusation, I restore fourfold. And Jesus said to him, today, salvation has come to this house because he also is a son of Abraham. <laughs> that is what Jesus says about this man. He calls him a son of Abraham. Jesus, how can you say that about Zacchaeus? Look at his action. Look at his fruit. It's not so much, oh, did he say the sinner's prayers? His actions, what? Restitution and generosity reveals his heart has changed. He's not that same man. But what happened? Truth brought a transformative life on the inside of Zacchaeus. Truth did it. It's the truth that did it. Jesus accepted him with no judgmental attitude, not judging his lifestyle, not condemning him, just accepting him, willing to get close, willing to go to his house, willing to receive his hospitality, engaging in conversation, sharing things with one another. All of us and kids begin to show actions that my heart has changed. I've been in the presence of the truth, of the word, hallelujah. And the Bible says, now Jesus tells him, today salvation is coming to this house. You are changed, Zacchaeus. You're born again. And then in verse 10, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was, that's his mission. That's his calling. That's the reason he came. Zacchaeus was lost. Jesus sought him out. Jesus found him, found him up in a tree with his heart open to the gospel. He experienced non-judgmental acceptance and he ended up valuing the opinion of God above the opinion of man. See, God knows the heart. He knows when a person is ready to respond to the gospel and we have to trust God and act on his word and sharing the gospel. God is the one who causes it to increase and bring spiritual fruit or harvest in people's lives. But we got a role. We got a responsibility. We got a ministry. What's the ministry? Reconciliation. What it look like? Either you're going to water or you're going to plant the seed of the word. God needs some planters and he needs some individuals that are going to water. How do you water? You cultivate. You encourage. You, you build up people. You come and bring confirmation uh, to, to them of God's mighty work in their lives. And all of a sudden they look unto Jesus and they acknowledge I'm a sinner, I need to be saved. And only Jesus Christ can provide salvation. So Zacchaeus is a good example of a heart that is ready. He just needed someone to spend time and provide him truth for transformative living. His actions of restitution and generosity confirms he has a changed heart. And Jesus, Jesus confirms that salvation has come to this house. This man is the son of Abraham. He's in the covenant. Why? Because that was my mission. That's why I came to his house. That's why I took time. That's why I was patient and loving and merciful and long-suffering with him because I knew that heart was ready to receive the message concerning Jesus Christ. So Zacchaeus, he was open to the gospel. He experienced non-judgmental acceptance he valued the opinion of God above the opinion of man. The great compassion. I have a few faith action questions. The first one is this. How did you come into the family of God? Everyone that's a Christian, that's saved, born again, you should be able to have some idea of how you came into the family of God. You were to tell me, well, when I was a baby, my parents dedicated me to the Lord. You're not in the family of God. If that's your witness, if that's what you got to bring to the table, you're not in the family of God. That is only a ceremony of them making a commitment that they are going to do their role and responsibility in making sure you brought up in the word. Hallelujah. That's what a baby dedication is about. It's about saying I'm going to be responsible to make sure that I bring this child up in the fear and admonition of the Lord. What's that? The teachings of Christ. The instructions of scripture. I'm going to model it 
and I'm going to make sure they have understanding of it. If you tell me, well, you know, I was baptized by Reverend so-and-so, you're not in the kingdom. You're not in the family. Water baptism does not bring you into the family of God. It happens after you enter the family of God. This is a witness of an outward show of an inward change, but the inward change has to take place before the outward show. You need to have somewhere in your understanding of faith of what was it like when you came into the family of God. Perhaps you need to come into the family of God. You need to repent. Say, Lord, I'm a sinner. I need to be saved. And Jesus Christ is the only one that can save me. The next question is, how did the acceptance of others without judging your lifestyle cause you to be open to God's love? If you were led to the Lord by someone sharing the message of Christ with you, sharing the truth of the gospel of Jesus, and, and they shared it with you in a non-judgmental way. In other words, they knew your lifestyle. They knew the way you were living. That was not the subject. That was not the conversation. That was not even something they focused on. They focus on telling you how much God loved you, that Jesus died for your sins, and Jesus died so you can have eternal life. That's the gospel. That's the good news. It's what Jesus did, not what I'm doing. What Jesus did in expressing his love to me by dying on the cross, that's the gospel. That's the good news. Now, once you let Christ in, again, the Holy Spirit and the word of God, they are going to do what is doing in all of our lives now. They are continually building us up in the things of God. We are being perfected in the things of We're maturing in the things of God. The last question, what actions did you display after having experienced the saving grace of Jesus? Zacchaeus' actions tell us this man has changed. And I've seen people say that. Oh, man, so-and-so now, boy, they have changed. Boy, they have changed. You know? Sometimes it's simple, boy, they're going to church now. But then they start seeing other things. Oh, yeah, they're not just going to church. They're living a transformed life. Their mind is being renewed with the word of God. They're taking changes in their lifestyle, all because they're growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus. All because the Holy Spirit is, is sanctifying them with the word of truth. Now, it's possible to give your life to Christ and don't be under the teaching of God's word. And you continue to live a carnal life. You continue to live a life as though as sinners. Oh, but that's not the will of God for you. God's will is for you to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. God's will for you to study to show yourself approved under God a work that need not to be ashamed, right? And dividing the word of truth. God's will for you is to do the work of the ministry. Hallelujah. Yes. Carry out the will of God in your life. Make some time. Uh, find somewhere to serve in God's kingdom. So often people want to know, oh God, what's your, what is your will for my life? I tell people, if you want to know your purpose, find a task. Find somewhere you can do in, the, in, 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 in your local church or somewhere to be able to represent God in that setting and give God the glory and watch how God begin to lead you into your calling. Well, I want to encourage you today. We got a, a ministry. We got a role to play in this world. Hallelujah. And I'm excited about it. I pray for opportunities to be able to share my story, share the message of Christ. Not because I'm a preacher. I was doing this before I became a preacher. Because I had tasted the goodness of Jesus. Hallelujah. Yes, I tasted the goodness of the Lord. And when you taste the goodness of God, you want everybody else to take a taste. You ever had something real good? Oh, man, it's good. You sometimes take somebody a taste. Or you'll tell them, taste this. Boy, the message of Christ, the new wine that Jesus brought. The scriptures, oh, the word of God, the word of God is sweet like the honey of the honeycomb. It is good, hallelujah. Well, I know you've been blessed by the word, and I know God is stirring up that evangelistic anointing on the inside of you. Paul told Tim, do the work of an evangelist. Yes, every one of us, every one of us are called to do the work of an evangelist. What's that? Soul winning, reaching others for Christ. But we can't carry out the great commission without the great compassion. And that's why God's got us in this area, teaching about the great compassion, what it is and what it does. Well, God bless you and have a great day in Jesus' name.